I would like to introduce this evening's speakers, uh, Ron Lichty and Tom Evans. Uh, both Ron and Tom have been uh, around Silicon Valley for quite some time uh, and are, are very familiar to the SVPMA audience. And uh, Ron is, uh, in particular, I remember quite a number of uh, presentations around agile and engineering leadership and uh, you know how how product managers relate to uh, relate to you know engineering management and then on Tom's side uh, he has been an instructor with the 280 group and for those of you not familiar with the 280 group at the very beginning of SVPMA 280 group uh, provided a huge number of the original content and speakers and expertise around getting SVPMA set up and they were a longtime SVPMA sponsor as well. So uh, we're happy to see uh, to see their name. Uh, they, they definitely have a long history with SVPMA, SVPMA as well. With that, I will uh, stop sharing and uh, we can hand it off to, to Ron. Terrific. Once my monitor comes back. <laughs> Got about a 20 second delay on, there's my screen. Stop share. Okay. So we should be sharing mine. And uh, we're gonna talk about how teams and leaders can unleash the power of Agile. Tom Evans and I, and uh, you can see pictures of us. Um, Tom, do you wanna start off by uh, introing yourself? Absolutely. So Tom Evans with the 280 Group, and, and I appreciate uh, Tom recognizing the engagement that 280 Group has had. Brian Lawley, the founder of 280 Group, was one of the past presidents. Uh, I personally haven't been quite as engaged because uh, I live in Austin, Texas, but I have uh, been engaged here uh, a lot with uh, Product Camp Austin and some of the product management activities. Uh, just some of my background, but I've been uh, doing this thing called product management for somewhere over 30 years now, and uh, have been an instructor with 280 Group for uh, 12 years and have had a lot of fun engaging with uh, many companies and uh, across different industries and looking forward to this, sharing my experience here. All right, and, uh, and uh, so I'm, um, so I've been consulting for the last 10 years in making software development hum. And one of those activities uh, is training teams. So Tom and I both do agile training. Tom tends to focus on product managers. I tend to focus on whole teams. And when I start off training teams in agile, one of the things I do is to do a go round and to ask how much, what's your experience been with agile? And I, and I hear some very interesting words from people. I hear things like, well, I was, that last company I was with was sort of agile. I hear uh, the word agile-ish every once in a while. Well, you know, the company I was with said they were agile. Uh, they, I think they were agile in name only. I love this one. This one came up a year ago. Uh, somebody said, we Frankenstein together an agile process. And then this is my favorite. Uh, our company sprinkles agile buzzwords across the annual plan like magic fairy dust. So frankly, being agile-ish isn't gonna cut it anymore if you're up against companies that are actually being agile because they're gonna outperform you. And so that's what we're gonna, that's what, that's what Tom and I are gonna talk about tonight. Uh, a little bit more introduction to me. So I was I started into tech as a programmer. Uh, this is this is one of my early programs. I was modifying the operating system on my microcomputer, and I was coding assembly language, hand assembling it into machine language, and poking those into memory locations. At a point at which one programmer could make a difference. That didn't that change pretty rapidly. And now, and soon there were whole teams of programmers. So, you know, I was in the microcomputer world. This had happened in the, in the mainframe world years and years, decades before me, but, but now we've got teams. And so after seven years of programming, I uh, became, I, I became a product manager. I became a manager of product managers. Actually, I was recruited by Apple to create a product management group for development tools. 
and I managed three different groups of, uh, of development tools product managers uh, at Apple. Uh, uh, Apple reordered every, every six months. So I, I got a chance to, to change which development tools I was working with every six months. And then after a year and a half of doing that, I went back to being a programmer and they promptly made me a manager. And six months later, another reorg, I went back to being a programmer and they promptly made me a manager. And, and the third time, the third time in, I um, actually embraced being a manager. And so this is this is my career path as a full-time engineer. I became a manager and then and then left Apple to be a director of engineering, was promoted to be a VP of engineering at Charles Schwab, um, at which point I was leading engineering teams. And then 10 years ago, I switched to being a consultant, as I said, to, to making software development hum, one of one of the activities of which is training teams. Uh, and after teams begged me, training executive teams in, in what this agile stuff is and what being agile is as opposed to being agile-ish is, uh, I coach VPs of engineering and, and CTOs and, uh, and, then, uh, and, and then occasionally get brought in to do assessments of what it would take to make a software development organization, product management organization, that combined product organization actually home. Uh, I wrote the I wrote one of the very few books on managing software people and teams. There were uh, when our first edition came out, there were there were we were, we were able to count only seven books on managing software people and teams in the history of computing. As sad as that is, you know how many how many scores and even hundreds of books there are in project management. Product management, not so many, but there are more than there are in managing software people and teams. Remarkably. There are now about twice that many, and our book's been translated into four languages and into video training. I also co-authored the study of product team performance, and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, when we get into some practices that we found some interesting results from. So this is our agenda for tonight. We're going to talk about doing agile or being agile, and 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 why why be agile as opposed to just doing agile. Why be agile as opposed to being agile-ish. Uh, but how so many of us end up just being agile-ish, what gets in the way, what the symptoms are of being agile-ish, and what Tom and I have both seen uh, uh, a lot of, and, uh, and then how to be, and then we'll talk about uh, what we've seen in, in actually becoming ag truly agile and, uh, and making a difference. So we're going to start, though, with a poll. And so I've got a poll. Devashish, can you, can you, uh, uh, paste the uh, Menti, thank you, the Menti meter uh, URL into the uh, into the chat. So you've got the URL there on the chat. Uh, go to menti.com and use that code right there, 33381391, to answer this poll that's on the screen right now. Where do you think your team lies? Ah, there we have some results coming in. I'll show you results in a minute. We have nine voters so far. We should have a few more before I actually share the results. And keep that window open because we'll allow, we'll give you a, another poll uh, uh, later on. All right, so let me share that and let's see what we've got here. All right, can, can all of you see the results? Can any of you see the I, results? I, I can see, yeah. Okay, good. So we can see that um, there's one person who said, we're not agile at all. One who said, yeah, barely. Uh, and, and then nobody said we're fully agile, uh, which is uh, interesting, Tom. That's uh, actually uh, probably not surprising because, you know, I think you and I have talked about several things is one is, you know, Agile is a, uh, you know, is a, uh, oh my, it's not a destination, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, 
voyage as such, you know, so you're continually trying to get there. But I think as I've worked with organizations, I don't know that I've ever actually seen one that could say they're fully agile. So um, not really overly surprising to me. Uh huh. Okay. So let's then jump back into slides and ask the question, what's the difference between doing agile and being agile? And, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a, a quick overview uh, that doing agile is really about practices and process. It's, it is tangible. Um, it's, it's a bunch of practices, a bunch of process. There's, there are actually, depending on which agile uh, set, of, set of tools you use, you're going to get a different set of practices and different process, but they're, all of them are very tangible. On the other hand, being agile is about values and principles. It's about mindset. Um, do uh, one of the one of the questions that that came up that uh, that comes up frequently? So I'm in a bunch of uh, discussion groups about agile on LinkedIn, and and every once in a while somebody will say, "Well, agile practices are worthless unless you've got an agile mindset." And it led me to ask that question: whether that's true or not. And so I threw up a bunch of examples of agile practices, these uh, sourced from Scrum and extreme programming and Kanban. Um, uh, here's a bunch of bullets here and I'll let you read them on your own. But when I put these together, I looked down that list and said, you know, every one of these is gonna, is gonna deliver value. In fact, when I started training teams in, in agile 13, 12, 13, 14 years ago, uh, and I was transforming water quality into agile. Every once in a while, I'd run into a team that had that had tried uh, tried Scrum specifically and gone back to waterfall. They were they were not able to embrace it, but they kept standups. They kept that idea of the team coming together. Software development is fundamentally a team sport, and and teams need to talk to each other at least once a day. Teams are based around collaboration and communication. And, they, and those stand-ups, they found valuable. So there's, there's value in all of these practices. They do deliver value. I'm gonna tangent for a second. Voting Ron, I, I just wanna uh, chime yeah. in there really quickly around that is that, uh, you know, even outside of product development activities or software development activities, I have seen teams put in agile practices, you know, having sprints and uh, doing the daily standups, uh, like marketing organizations and either other types of organizations. And they have truly gained value from that just because it does support, you know, some of the underlying principles of, of uh, agile also. Terrific. So I want to tangent to a metaphor Voting is a process. Voting machines are tools that support that process. Do voting and voting machines make us a democracy? Do voting and voting machines make any country that uses voting and voting machines democracies? We know that the answer is no. Voting and voting machines do not make us a democracy. Democracy emanates from values and principles. Similarly, Agile practices don't make us agile. Agile practices do deliver better outputs, as, as uh, Tom and I were just talking about on that previous slide. They do deliver better outputs. There are some, there are some great practices that Agile introduced or that Agile um, uh, recognized as being great practices and incorporated. But Agile practices don't deliver great teams. Agile values inspire great teams. And to go to a few of the values, here are a few of the values from the Agile Manifesto from 20 years ago. Build projects around motivated individuals, trust to get the job done, face-to-face -face conversation, self-organizing teams. The team reflects and tunes and adjusts. Tom, do you want to uh, jump in here? Yeah, th this just builds on it. Uh, you know, the concepts that you were talking about, Ron, but uh, you know, as I look across these core principles of Agile, you know, I think there's two that really stand out to me. And, and one is, you know, the one that you stated around trust. 
And when I look at organizations that have bureaucratic processes in place and slow decision making, a lot of that comes down to trust. But, you know, in parallel with that, or lack of trust is what I should say. And I think in parallel with that is that in order to be able to create trust, though, those who are executing on the work also have to have a sense of accountability and a commitment of accountability. And so, you know, when I start thinking of what's the foundation of all of these, you know, at least in my mind, it's that, you know, it's that trust, it's that, you know, accountability, collaboration, communications are kind of those key items that make it work. Yeah, real accountability to each other. Mm -hmm. Real, really, truly teamwork. Not a bunch of people who report to the same standup, but a, yep. mm -hmm. a group of people who are accountable to each other. All right. So why are so knowing that being agile is is beneficial by a lot? Why? What gets in the way? So why do we do agile and not be agile? So one of those is misunderstandings. There's, there's, um, and part of this is historic. The, the going from waterfall, which was a very cut and dried process that could be driven by project managers. There's that notion of, well, all we have to do is just do those practices and, and we'll be agile. Lack of role models. The, um, the, the challenge of, um, so I, you know, when, when I became a manager for the first time, my previous managers had all been either um, uh, micromanagers or throw you in the deep end managers. And, uh, and it wasn't until I went to Apple that Apple, um, I, I opted into a class called situational leadership that suggested to me that throwing the college kid I had just hired into the deep end and watching him sink or drown, sink or swim, swim or drown was not a good idea. And, and this, this, this agile stuff, the self-organizing teams, the psychological safety stuff, the, the, um, the theory why management stuff, all of which gloms together into, uh, in, into what being agile is, is fairly recent and it's tough sometimes finding role models. Um, you know, we've got um, centuries of micromanagement and centuries of uh, telling people what to do, centuries of theory X leadership um, that go with a lack of role models. Tom, do you wanna jump in on this one? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I was reading a book and, and, and one of the things that it talked about is if you look at what we consider modern management actually goes back into, you know, the early 1900s, I think with Frederick Taylor, you know, where he looked at scientific management and all of it was about how do we get a factory to work more efficiently? And, and so all the ways that we have been organized over the last, you know, 100 years or more has really been based upon that. And what we haven't done well enough is break away from those models of command and control, you know, that were put in place back then to make factories more efficient. Yeah. And then there's culture. The... Um... Culture sometimes, so culture, and, and, and you can look at this in mission statements and value statements in our companies. And some of those are really good and really strong, but some pieces of culture will get it there. More often than not, the leaders of our companies came up through sales. And um, uh, I have arguments with salespeople around whether sales is a team sport or not, but I know that software development's a team sport. And I know that uh, rewarding the best developer by sending them to play golf with the CEO is not something that most developers desire. That's not, that's not an appropriate award for most developers. And in fact, what we're looking for is developers working with each other to create something greater than the sum of the developers on that team. Yeah, you know, the other part of culture that stands out to me, and, and it kind of goes back to the history side of it, uh, but one of the common terms or 
phrases that I've heard in organizations when I've been training product managers is the, you know, something along the line of like our product development teams are agile, which they actually mean are practicing agile, but our business processes are not agile. And so the way that they make decisions, you know, that are strategic uh, type decisions tend to be a little more bureau bureaucratic and then uh, you know, funding models, funding models are very waterfallish in many organizations. And so, you know, when your funding is waterfall, how well can you actually be agile as an organization? Yeah, finance has only recently grasped the, the opportunity and the benefit of, of agile from a, from a um, tax, from a tax accounting standpoint. Uh, because all of those accountants were all taught waterfall accounting in school. Uh, and then there's mindset. And that mindset, that, that theory X mindset of, well, well, we'll tell them what to do. We product managers, we managers, we directors of engineering, we project managers, we'll just tell uh, developers what to do and they'll do their little part and, and it will... And that doesn't create the best stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and that brings into me the uh, military analogy. And, and again, reading some books here recently, and one of them was talking about if you look at militaries, um, you know, in certain battle situations, especially referring back to World War II, is, you know, there were situations that there was a very strict, here's exactly how we're going to operate the battle plan. And when things changed because you're you know in a uh, highly dynamic environment at that point people had to go back up to headquarters to say well what do we do now and so just that decision making process you know made them uh it in a put them in a situation where they couldn't win where the armies you know that clearly define here's the objective that we're trying to achieve and set a strategy in place but left the execution up to them we're much more successful. And I think that's kind of, you know, reflects what you're talking about, Ron, is, you know, whether it's product development or something else is here's our project plan. Here's exactly how you're going to execute and don't deviate from that. It doesn't work well in battle and it doesn't work well in software. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some symptoms of being agile-ish. So standups are really just status meetings. Standups, or as they're called in Scrum, daily scrums, are not intended to be status meetings. They're intended to be replanning meetings. One of the, one of the real ahas for me was, was going off and, uh, and looking at the definition of Scrum. So Scrum is, scrum, and it turns out that, that Scrum is a great name for that process uh, for anywhere but in the United States, because none of us know what, know, know what Scrum is. And, and I had this picture of all of these muddy players pushing a ball around. And that is what a scrum is. But the definition is it's a way of restarting the game. And the daily scrum is a way of restarting the game every single day. Software development's a team sport. Maybe we ought to talk to each other at least once a day and see how we're doing against our plan and, and whether we need to adjust that plan as a team, as developers and testers and product managers, whether we need to adjust our plan. You know, and some organizations are, you know, who are trying to make the rest of their decision making agile will do uh, scrums at a higher level in the organization so that any issues that come up that need to be pushed up to a higher level of decision, they're not sitting and waiting, the, you know, another month until they meet and make a decision. They're getting that passed up, you know, that very day so that those executives can make a decision and, and keep that team running productively. One of the one of the symptoms of agile which I see is not only standups being just status meetings, but being pushed off to being done in Slack. No team generated definition of done. So I told you that I would come back to the the uh, being a co-author of the study of product team performance. So um, um, we've done uh so i and i've and, and i've been here at the svpma presenting results and so i've probably presented this result so i'm presenting it again we um the, the uh, study of product team performance we ask people on product teams all over the world 
product managers, developers, testers, um, uh, uh, BAs, uh, project managers, people are, uh, everybody on product teams all over the world. Characterize your team. Is it high performance or low performance or something in between? And then we ask about practices and we've got a data science member of our team who looks to see whether there's a correlation between, uh, uh, between those practices and high performance teams. And definition of done, um, uh, about the fifth study of product team performance, it, it occurred to me that I had run into the team generating a definition of done for that, that it would apply to all of its stories. So we're not talking about um, uh, acceptance criteria here, which is a story by story basis. We're talking about the definition of done that we apply to all of our stories. And it occurred to us that, uh, it occurred to me that this might be one of the most important practices in Agile, and and that I could uh, that I could find out whether there was a correlation with high performance teams by by uh, uh, lobbying to get it into our study. My co-authors, um, uh, Greg Geraci being the the lead co-author on that study, um, and we asked the question not do you have a definition of done, but who creates your definition of done which led us to find out that, that those teams that don't have a definition of done, no one created them, those teams that don't have a definition of done absolutely correlate with the lowest performance teams. Just having a definition of done doesn't correlate with the highest performance team. It's having a definition of done that was created by the team. It wasn't handed to them by, by, uh, by management. It wasn't handed to them by executives wasn't handed to them by product management. It wasn't handed to them by the VP of engineering. The team, now the team may have subclassed uh, one of those that was handed to them from on high and said, you know, here's the baseline. But that team then recrafted it in their, in their own team's words to be meaningful for their team and for the results of their team. And, and those, those definitions of done that were that were crafted by the team itself correlated with the highest performance teams. When I the first time that Ron and I met was I think about eight years ago, where we uh, did a joint engagement, and and uh, Ron talked about how important that definition of done was, and and I didn't really appreciate how how important that was, but as I have, you know, studied agile more and worked with organizations. I've come to appreciate how important that is in terms of making sure work gets completed. Uh, you know, you uh, manage your technical debt that you don't create issues that slow you down later on. Uh, so yeah, I, I uh, double confirm that importance of that definition of done now. Yeah, and, and let me be clear that this is the whole team. So this is developers, testers, product managers, mm -hmm. BA, whoever's on the team comes together and and uh, I facilitated a ton of those and, and it's like probably 45 minutes to think through what criteria we want to apply to every story to know that it's done and that we can move on with confidence that um, that we're not we're that the only reason we're going to come back to this is we we've introduced some new functionality that that uh, causes a collision. So stories that are being assigned to sprints or assigned to developers. So product managers, you get this, this amazing, uh, and, and, I, and I love my product management counterparts because I love the fact that you're doing it and I'm not, which is prioritizing what's in the backlog. I love the fact that developers can walk up to the backlog and know that that top story in the backlog is what's gonna deliver the most, most value to our customers. And the second story is the one that's going to deliver the next most value to our customers and our and our business, and the third and, and and so on. It is an ordered list based on that, and and that's just absolutely stunning. But once we get into sprint planning, it is the team's job. So now I'm going to use team with a small t. It's the developers and testers and maybe UX designers role to figure out how to be most effective in delivering as much of what's at the top of the backlog as they can. And they may look at the top story and say, well, well, Bob and Sue are integral to that story and they're both on PTO this sprint. We're going to skip that top story and go to the second and go to the second story or or you know we're we're going to overload the uh, the the database folks if we if we just pull straight from the top, we're going to we're going to pull a couple from the top and skip down 
to some UX heavy ones in order to in order to balance and deliver the most be most effective we can with a sprint plan. Now that's a sprint plan that they then that they then propose to product management to say, will our will our customers, and I look at customers as being external customers, executives, and stakeholders, will our customers accept this sprint plan as the best sprint plan for us? So we're looking for that best sprint plan, and, and that's not assigning stories to people. Uh, stories that are too big. Story, and I've run it and I've run into this really frequently. And this is this is a hard one. It's it is uh, incumbent upon product management to solve. Uh, breaking, breaking, and, and we can talk about how to break stories into smaller stories, but, but developers need to be able to pull, developers and testers need to be able to pull stories into sprints that they can finish both development and testing on by the end of the sprint. They have to be ideally half a sprint or less, which allows them to balloon if they run into a bunch of technical debt in the area that they're working in that they didn't know was there. Um, I run into teams every once in a while where that have barely a sprint's worth of backlog. Now, occasionally, I even run into a team that says, "You know, we go we go into it, and there's not enough in the backlog even to fill a sprint." That's uh, what we really. So we tested, uh, and, and um, it occurred to me I wasn't at all. I was pretty sure about the definition of done, what I was going to find there, but I wasn't at all sure what I was going to find when we tested this with a study of product team performance. But we asked. How long is your um, is your backlog, and uh, and have you estimated? Have has your development team, your development and testing team, estimated those stories that are in your backlog? And what we found was that the teams that correlated with the highest performance teams had three months or more of backlog and had estimated all three months or more of backlog. Not uh, not waterfall kind of estimation. Uh, so actually we didn't ask, but I'm not gonna recommend waterfall style uh, estimation. It's too, way too expensive, but uh, really inexpensive relative sizing for that whole backlog is just wonderful. Um, then I run into, and so Tom was referring to this a little while, Tom, you were referring to this a little while ago when you're talking about uh, outside of the product team, so here's, uh, and I'm working with a team right now that that the, um, it's like, can you make our development team go faster? It's like, well, how about the four months that the executives spend trying to figure out, trying to get consensus around what to build? That's what's slowing you down. It's not, <laughs> I, can, you know, I, can, I can help the development team go 5% faster, sure. That's not where the cost is. Yeah, that, you know, that's my point about, you know, or at least part of the point around, uh, you know, the business not being agile is that, uh, you know, if you think about agile, what you want to do is know that directionally, here's where we want to go. You know, we want to have clear goals and objectives in place of what we're trying to accomplish. But because so many executives have come from this traditional command and control model, you know, they're looking for a project that says, here's exactly what we're going to deliver at the end. And by the way, here's a project plan. Once we see that, we're going to go and fund it. But we all know, especially in software, but even in those of you that are doing more, you know, manufactured devices and hardware, you get into your development processes, you learn new things. There's a lot of uncertainties that you're dealing with. And so, you know, things are going to change, but yet, you know, we're to, we still have executive teams that think if I create the perfect project plan and we know all the requirements, we're going to execute to it perfectly. And, and it just doesn't happen that way. So I want to I add a second bullet to this one. When we make a change, those have to recycle through all of those executive sign offs. Mm -hmm. So by the way, that that uh, that company that recently I was seeing this with has been fighting this by bringing in strong product management. Mm -hmm. Product management, it's product management's job to figure out what the product is on, as, uh, on the fly as we go along to figure out that we're delivering the most effective stuff to our customers, uh, which you all know. 
Yeah, you, you know, I, I'm not going to get into a, a, a big discussion around this, but you do see, a, a, we see a lot of companies moving toward the idea of OKRs, objectives and key results. And that's one of the things that we are really trying to encourage product managers to work with in terms of their planning cycles is what are your objectives and key results without saying, here's exactly how we're going to do that. And this takes, you know, this goes back to those points of trust and accountability that we, we talked about is there has to be a high level of trust with management to be able to say, I trust that you're going to deliver on that. But it's also, you know, we as product managers taking accountability to make sure that we do deliver on those uh, results, whether we've specified exactly what that project is looking like. Yeah, one of the one of the one of the dials and one of the uh, meters that that we're trying to move here, and let's make sure we're doing that. So one of the one of the things that I run into pretty frequently is agile is agile agile process is based around experiments, and the goal is to have is to come out of a retrospective. The goal in Scrum is to have a retrospective at the end of every sprint, more commonly two weeks than not. And to come out of that retrospective with one experiment to try for some fixed period of time that we're going to that we're going to try and then evaluate to see whether uh, one whether it delivered the so scientific method whether it delivered what we thought it was going to deliver two whether it delivered uh, results that are that are worth having even that even unexpected ones and three the pain's not so high doing this experiment that um, that we're that uh, that we're going to reject it out of out of hand, and and we and, and and every single retrospective should be delivering one at one, maybe two at most three experiments that we're going to try. Um, you know, this is this is core to it's core to agile, it's core to software development, it's 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 core to uh, high performance teams, which is respect and trust. And Tom brought those up earlier. Yep. It is just it is just core to um, uh, um, high performance teams. And uh, and and what's the opposite of that? Command and control executive style. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, of, I think we talked over that one pretty well. <laughs> all, all of all of those are symptoms of agile. So with that, we're going to go to our second poll. And uh, Debashish, can you plug the, uh, the URL and the uh, uh, Menti um, uh, code? Follow the code. And I'll bring up the second poll. So which of these symptoms of Agilish do you see in your organization? Okay, we have about 10 people in, so I'm gonna share the screen in about 20 more seconds. <clears throat> no need to hum the Jeopardy theme song. <laughs> okay, let's not do that. All right, can you see the can you see the results of the poll at this point? Yes, it's come through. Okay, good. Hard to tell what people are seeing. So a lot of teams aren't trying new experiments each, each sprint. Um, Mike Cohn, who was the original, I'm told he was the original trainer of Scrum, said, uh, if, if, if your team is not, uh, if your team hasn't learned something a year from now, you're not being agile. Your team is not better than it, was, than, than it is today. A year from now, you're not being agile. 
looks like uh, oh, we've got a uh, pretty high level of command and control executive yeah. style there. Yeah. Tom. Uh, that is, uh, again, not surprising, you know, as much as we want to think that we're agile within our organizations, we still have such a strong culture of command and control. Um, uh, definitions of done, not team created, uh, which doesn't, which doesn't surprise me because they, um, uh, I've given talks on definitions of done and people will say, oh, thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> We, you know, and, and it's interesting as, as I've talked to uh, different organizations, especially as they're trying to implement agile principles, they do tend to take the approach of let's create a corporate definition of done. And, and I think as you have really talked about it, you know, if your team's going to embrace it, they have to make it their own. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it needs to be in their words and, and, uh, and they need to address the stuff that they're, that they're expecting to come up against. And, it, and it's something that they can retrospect on uh, if it's not working for them. And I see here, and, and I'm glad to see that, uh, that um, standups that are really just status meetings are as few as they are. They're the next level, but, uh, but it's, it's not the highest, which I'm glad to see for all of you. And that um, stories assigned to sprints and, and developers are uh, at that same level. All right, Ryan, so let, Ryan, yeah, no, sorry, uh, there was one uh, chat message that, see, that said it seems like definition of done without any standards consistency could be problematic. You want to uh, you want to address and share any of your thoughts on that particular question? Yeah, so I think in a, in a large company, we'll probably have we'll probably have a baseline definition of done. The, um, we'll have an architecture committee or, uh, or, or you know, some combination of, of uh, development, design, and, um, and product management will come together and say, this is our baseline definition of done. But each team then needs to, as Tom was just saying, needs to make it their own. Um, I'm working with a team now in, uh, out of Denver that every single time they start a project, part of their chartering, part of their new project, new product chartering is, does our definition of done, will our definition of done uh, uh, meet what we need for this project, for this release? And they, and they revisit their definition of done every single time they have a new, uh, a new release coming up. Really valuable. Did I answer that question for whoever mm -hmm. asked it? All right, then let's jump back into slides again and, and talk about how to fix things. How to become truly agile. So doing products not projects. Tom, do you want to talk about doing products, not projects? Well, and I'm going to speak uh, to this from uh, two perspectives. And one is a lot of this has initially evolved from the IT world, uh, where internal uh, teams were creating you know, tools or applications to be used within the organization. And those historically have had a very project oriented focus to them where like they approve the project and then that gets executed and then it doesn't get touched again. And, and so we definitely are now seeing where uh, internal IT groups are looking at it and say, you know what, these are products that need to be continued to reviewed and enhance uh, over time. And I'm actually working with a, uh, one of the large consulting companies uh, to guide them as they make this transition from projects to product, because they, they need to manage those throughout the life cycle. But, it, you know, aligned with that then is we have to go into that product mentality saying, we don't know every single detail, what we're going to develop, you know, even in the next project cycle uh, and, and be able to entrust product managers to, you know, make uh, some of those decisions and, and to fund the product you know, versus funding the project itself, giving the product manager, you know, as we talked about, the product manager defines a set of goals that they want to achieve, and maybe some epic level type things, but not to say you have to have a fully defined project before we're, we're going to fund it. 
Um, you know, along that line, and, and I'm, I'm going to put in the chat link a little bit. I did a webinar about two months ago on agile funding, and I, I'll, I'll show you the, share that link with you. Uh, but, you know, there are definitely methods that companies are creating to do more agile type funding. And part of that is to take on a much more product mentality versus a project by project type mentality. And, you know, there's another there's another piece to this, which is which is having stable teams. Yes, absolutely. Rather than, that is rather than uh, oh, what does this project need? Let's pull Bob from here and Sue from there and Rajiv from here and and uh, Ella from there. Um, uh, actually, having teams together that uh, that that have already that have already gone through storming and norming and uh, mm -hmm. and getting to performing. I have trouble with all the sequence of those. Um, that they've, they've already gone through that. Yep. They've already they've already developed trust and respect for each other. They're they're already gelling as a team. Uh, uh, too uh, too uh, too often, those of you who are product managers and those of us who are engineering managers get get uh, get at, get tasked by our executive teams to just make just make development run faster. <laughs> Uh, none of none of us, none of you, none of us can make development run faster. What we can do is we can we can uh, uh, develop that uh, that trust and that respect. We can we can enable and enhance. We can build environments in which teams thrive, and we can have teams that do thrive and not throw them to the winds at the end of a project, but to actually give them life. I, I was speaking to a general manager about two years ago of a group, and, and I had heard that he had this perspective around, you know, uh, my development resources are fungible. I can move them around to anywhere that I want them to be. And so when I was interviewing him, I asked him what he thought about that. He says, oh, yeah, I think they're fungible. We can move them around. What do you think? And I said, well, we don't we think differently about that. And but it was a very common complaint that I was hearing in his organization about you know, this just moving development resources around, you know, for one, it takes away predictability from the product managers. But the second thing that you talked about, Ron, is, you know, that learning to work together. And then there was another uh, large construction company that I worked with about four or five years ago, and they had already made that transition to stable teams. And they found that, you know, their ability to really deliver uh, new tools to their construction teams May it, it made a significant difference in that predictability and and uh, you know that ability to deliver things that really made a difference for the organization. Cool. So uh, being outcomes driven, not output driven. So uh, my I think it's my, I don't blog very often, um, uh, but I think it's my most recent blog post. It's probably about a year ago that begins, do not ever, ever, ever let velocity be used as a measure of performance or productivity. Velocity is an internal measure that teams use in order, in order to gain predictability. It's a measurement of pace. Um, similarly, uh, we learned, year, I, I hope all of us learned decades ago that measuring lines of code is a really dumb thing to do. And, uh, and, and trying to measure productivity is um, turns out turns out to be pretty difficult, but measuring outcomes, um, uh, measuring the results of what it is that we do is really where is really what are we trying to do? We're trying to delight our customers. Let's find out whether we're doing that or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the ideas of OKRs and and uh, you know in some of the training classes we talk around you know uh, product metrics and knowing exactly what metrics you're trying to improve upon for your product versus saying, here's the features we want. It's really about what kind of metrics are we trying to improve within that product? Yes, moving those dials. Uh, being outcomes driven, not process driven. So it's not, it's not about the process. So uh, uh, um, uh, Agile, um, the, the point is being effective. Agile just gives us insights. Respect and trust and psychological safety. I'm hoping that all of you have at this point 
uh, gone off and looked at the at, at Google's Aristotle project from five years ago, which introduced in my in, in my experience, it introduced the, those two words psychological safety for the very first time in software development. I had not seen them before in software development. One of the things you may, even if you have gone off and looked at the Aristotle study, one of the things you may not have seen is Google said you can actually see teams that are high performance teams. You can actually see the psychological safety. They said teams with psychological safety our highest performance teams have equality and conversational turn taking. There is no one on those teams who is silent and there's no one who is dominating. There is equality in conversational turn taking. Yeah, that's a great I, study. I, I um, have uh, done a bunch of talks in which I've asked people to think about the best teams that they've been on. And, uh, and, and to think through your career, what's the best team you've been on and what were the characteristics of that team? And there's never been a time when I did that, that the words respect and trust did not come up as two of those characteristics. They are always part of being, being they're always part of best teams. Collaboration with customers, actually going out and spending time with customers. Product managers take developers along on a, on a, on a round robin basis. Take our, take our testers along on a round robin basis. Make sure that uh, there, there's nothing, there's nothing more convincing to a developer than seeing the thing that they know work, seeing customers stumble over it. That is, you know, one of the things that I'm seeing organizations do a much better job of, and I'm gonna say this, I've even seen this improve significantly over the last three or four years, is getting customer feedback early in their cycles. And so getting that validation when you're planning, uh, you know, when you're testing concepts initially, you know, as you're starting to uh, gel your requirements and maybe even coming up with some, uh, you know, wireframes or, you know, more detailed product concepts, getting that feedback. And then as you are, you know, reaching points of uh, prototypes, et cetera, getting, getting feedback. And, and that is so important because too often we, you know, delivered something thinking we were on the right track. And then we got the customer feedback uh, once we were in production or it was already out, uh, you know, in the market. And that's when we found out we were wrong. So, you know, we would rather learn that we're wrong earlier in that process, you know, than uh, later in that process. And I'm going to throw out one other thing. And in, in, uh, in one of the, uh, when we were doing the networking, and I'm trying to remember who uh, was in that group, talked about, I'm more in the hardware type world. And some of the concepts of Scrum, you know, or, you know, agile software development are hard to, uh, you know, apply. But I am reading a book here recently that's called When uh, Agile Gets Physical. And one of the things I really like is, that rapid, you know, learning cycles, and whether it's with customers or just learning on your own, it's still such an important concept of, uh, you know, of applying agile in any world, but definitely in more of the uh, hardware development type world. And using the agile manifesto as a window to ask the question, are our practices actually agile? Are we you know, the, the Agile Manifesto gives us a sense of the values and principles to look at our, to, to, as a window to look at our practices and ask, are we doing Agile or are we actually being Agile? You know, one of the things, there's a, a quote and I, that we've used in 280 Group, and I think it's, it goes back to the Dalai Lama or someone like that that talks about, you know, learn the rules and once you understand the rules, you can break the rules. And I think that's, the, you know, starts to separate is the agile, the rules of Scrum or, you know, whatever agile uh, technique that you're using, those are there so that you can learn the practice, but, you know, before you fully understand it. But during that process, I want to understand it. And then let's figure out 
you know, how do we really make it our own? Tom, do you want to add any more about uh, the bullets here on this slide? No, th th this is just, again, emphasizing the points that we made earlier, you know, in, in, in the slide. Um, and, you know, this is not going to happen right away. Uh, you know, I, I'm working with, I mentioned a bit, one of the big consulting firms I'm working with, and, you know, we're trying to do some transformation around product manager. And some of that is making agile a, uh, you know, at a business level, more of that. And we recognize that's going to be a two or three year transformation that they're going to go through. So, uh, you know, we have to be patient with it, that if we're not going to get it right from the beginning, but you know, keep in mind what the goal is and, you know, take those small steps forward. So that brings us to Q&A. All righty. Well, this, this has been, uh, this has been interesting. I wanted to tack on really quickly while we still had kind of the warm, uh, uh, warm topic. Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, somebody had asked a question about applying uh, agile to hardware-based products, but I think also, uh, you know, I've seen it where you're trying to adapt it to services or uh, customer experiences and some other more fuzzy things that don't look like code. Uh, would you care to say a few words kind of about, about adapting this and pushing agile into you know, non-software product things? So Tom, you want to, you want to, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, you know, the outside of our product organization there, uh, first, the, the, the first thing that I think about is our organizations that, um, what's the word I want to use is that they, they give their customer facing personnel, the right to delight customers. And sometimes that means they have some flexibility. I mean, that typically means they have that flexibility in, in the decision-making that they need to do to help make a, a, a customer uh, happy. And, you know, I go back and I think about a book that if I don't know how many remember Tom Peters, but, uh, you know, Tom Peters, you know, had uh, several books that I can't even remember the name of now, but, uh, you know, where he, he talked about that delegation of authority. And I think he told one story about FedEx where somebody had to deliver a package and there was a snowstorm and they hired a helicopter to get it there, you know, because they had the, uh, you know, right, the authority to be able to go and make a decision like that. I work with other companies and, and uh, you know, I happen to be a member of USAA and when I'm talking to one of their, you know, member service representatives, I feel like that they are empowered to do what they need to do to help, you know, satisfy the questions that I have. And so, you know, I think that's there. Zappos probably is very famous uh, from that perspective. And so, you know, it, it, it's, I think that's the part of Agile that I take away as being the most important part in a Southwest Airlines, there's another one, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's where uh, some of these Agile principles really start to apply. So I think there's, I think there's uh, two, two different, two different parts of that. One is values and principles and one of yep. them is, is practices. And from a values and principles standpoint, it's, it's helping the executive team, maybe, or or whatever part of the organizations outside of the product organization, include, include sales, includes marketing, uh, includes customer success and customer service, oftentimes, but helping them to understand that that what is going on inside the product organization is product managers are are building a vision of where the product is going, what's going to what's going to most delight customers. The development and testers are, are building are building that incrementally, and and we're testing it against customers through product management to find out whether we're on track or not, and whether we're building the right thing, whether we're truly delighting customers as we go along, and and helping to bring them into that cycle, and and uh, and that cycle is about delighting customers. Second, on a pra on a practices standpoint, interestingly, I was I was a speaker at Agile Indy. 
in Indianapolis uh, five or six years ago. And one of the other speakers was the, uh, I, I think he was the VP of engineering at uh, Farm Credit in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, this is all pre-pandemic, of course, and the, the, the uh, old times as somebody, I just saw somebody refer to it uh, earlier today, back in the old times, when people were together, he had his whole team together. And so he put up a physical card wall uh, on, uh, on the wall in the team's room. And he said two things, two things happened um, uh, as a result of doing that beside, outside of just my team. The first was that my boss, and now I don't remember whether his boss was the CIO or the CEO, but he said my boss stopped coming by and asking, when's it going to be done? And started looking at that card wall. Because it was a, it, it, those are referred to in Agile as information radiators, and boy, they do that. Um, I helped a CIO in waiting uh, as a uh, uh, I was coaching a CIO in waiting, and and we did that outside his office, and and all the people with stuff that they were that they wanted to get onto the list, you know, all of you are product managers know that you've got to have the mantra of what a great idea. Let me put that on my backlog, and uh, and, and that's essentially what we were doing for him was was letting him create that because. Uh, for internal projects, he was the guy, and uh, and, and so we did that. What uh, so back to back to Louisville, Kentucky. He said the first thing was my boss stopped asking when it what, when it was going to be done. He said the second thing was that Cardwell started appearing in every other department. <laughs> he said we only have one department in our company that doesn't have a Cardwell now. And they got out of doing status meetings. Uh or building custom PowerPoint decks to explain to the executives where, where things were. <laughs> uh, Bavesh had a, a, a good question. He was asking, we had a few people ask about like CICD and some of the other agile things, but uh, Bavesh, you had a question specifically on safe. Would you uh, unmute and ask your question? Sure, Tom. Thanks for the opportunity. So my question to the presenters uh, is, uh, can they please share their experience and views on SAFE? Because I'm right now in an environment uh, where SAFE uh, is being uh, rolled out over the last few months. So I'm just interested in kind of getting your views. Uh, anything like good, bad, or ugly, what to watch out for uh, as part of the team? And I'm specifically being in the product management role, et cetera. Thanks. So, um, I've, I've got two, two. I've got two answers to that, Avesh. Um, one, of, one of them is that um, safe up, appeared to me. I had no hope whatsoever. So the second is going to be hope for safe. The first was I had no hope whatsoever for safe ever being being agile as opposed to doing agile. The, the sense that it was an excuse to do to glom together a whole bunch of practices that look like agile that are agile-ish without actually ever being agile. Now the hope side to so the second the second impression, I was I was uh, I was at a talk uh, in uh, in Seattle um, uh, by an Australian mm -hmm. woman, an author. Uh, 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 um, uh, her last name, uh, Campbell Pretty. Um, um, uh, I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking for her book because it's it's. Um, uh, I wish I could name it. So, um, mm -hmm. anybody know what that is? Somebody, Campbell Pretty, um, uh, Campbell Dash Pretty. Um, she was talking about forming teamwork. Forming uh, teamwork at the at, at the uh, sort of uh, department level of uh, of being thrown in, of being thrown into a large corporation, and she's a safe trainer, being thrown into a large corporation that people were working side by side with each other and didn't even know you know didn't even know each other's names. Now I, I know this can happen because I've walked into a large corporation in San Francisco and and run into one of my former Schwab colleagues there and said, oh, do you, you know, you know, Bob or Sue or somebody is over there. And they, and they were like, really? 
on the same floor, same building, same company, no idea that anybody other than their team existed. What, what um, M, and it's M Campbell Pretty, M-E-M, -E M, M Campbell Pretty. Um, and, uh, and, she, and she's, written, she's written two books, the first of which was uh, uh, pretty stunning, I thought, mm -hmm. because it talks about building that teamwork at a team level instead at the organizational level and taking safe training and stubbing in two days of teamwork building, chartering essentially, before ever getting into the safe practices. And, and, what I, and what I saw there was safe practices being built on, uh, on values and principles that I had not heard a great deal of in other organizations. Tom, mm -hmm. do you have any? You know, I'm not an expert in safe, but I've kind of listened and observed. Uh, and I think when I first started to pay attention to safe, which was probably about five years ago, there was there was very few companies actually implementing it and what i found interesting is over the last uh, really two years i have seen a lot more companies implementing uh safe practices so i think one is and as a, as i've gone back and looked at some of the more updated uh information around safe i do feel like they're trying to put a more agile uh feeling around it uh, but it is still what I would say very prescriptive in terms of how you implement it, which I think takes away some of that, you know, feeling that we want to get in terms of uh, agile. And, and, and but I love Ron's statement where you know let's get people understanding, you know, some of these core principles before we uh, go and implement it. I think if you go and look at uh, you know writings, and I think it's. Uh, it's probably Marty Kagan, who just, you know, completely demonizes safe. Uh, He's you not know, the he, only one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there are many, there are more than one yeah, yeah. that, you know, demon, I'm thinking about this from a product management practice. But here's the thing is that I, as I have seen in certain organizations, and, and this applies in uh, financial services is one of the big areas I've seen it in others, where you... I mean, as much as you want to try to be an Amazon and say, you know, or a, a Google and say somebody owns a thread of value, sometimes that the, the products that you're building your services on top of are so overlapped and interactive, et cetera, that the only way that you can actually execute is safe. And, you know, without them building completely from the ground up their own software, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they're using a lot of third party software safe is really one of the only ways that they can actually realistic coordinate every all the dependencies that they have. And ideally, we want to break those dependencies in a software world anyways, to where, you know, one team owns a delivery of value, but it's just some of these environments are so complex that safe is just the only way they can do it. So as much as you want to demonize it, there's just uh, some companies I don't think can uh, get around that. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think it has to do with their culture. <laughs> uh, so, some of it will come back to culture, but some of it is just their, you know, the, the technology that they're working on top of. Hmm. Is, is there some, th some uh, room hmm. where perhaps organizational structure plays a role? You were mentioning kind of interconnects, and I'm thinking about matrix organizations where somebody's not, you know, the traditional model, we show a simplified diagram of I'm, I'm in my one team and not, mm -hmm. oh, I'm, I'm actually in three teams that are report up through three different channels as a resource. And then how, how does that fit in and complicate and create its own set of nightmares? Yeah. So, so here's, here's the situation that I'm, I'm referring back to. I'm going to use a company I worked with uh, about four years ago that they uh, issue debit cards. So their product are these debit cards. And for each debit card, you have certain features it can have like, oh, it can connect into a checking account. It has rewards associated with it. 
And I can go and bundle those features together into different debit card type products. And, and so one is you've already created a dependency between these features and you know supporting different products in their customer facing portfolio. But then the challenge is, is when you look at those different features, those features may have a dependency in the CRM system, in an ERP system, in a, you know, other type of system, and they have tentacles that dig into five different systems. And that's where those dependencies just become really difficult to, you know, manage is because you've built on top of, you know, five, 10, 20 different platforms that one feature or capability is touching into, and then you're supporting multiple products even above you. That's, that's that dependency that I, I just don't know that how well you can break it, uh, you know, at short least short with, of re-architecting the whole thing. Yeah, short of re-architecting the whole thing, exactly. Uh, it seems like a lot of cloud scale things or, you know, microservices and all of that. We, we've got a, a larger amount of people that are running into that as an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Bavesh, did that kind of answer? Give oh, you uh, that helps me quite a bit. Yes, I really appreciate it. Uh, my own comment in this regard is uh, that I'm keeping an open mind at this point um, and absorbing what I'm learning and I've been uh, getting from the agile coach or coaches that uh, were brought in. Uh, but at times it sort of feels like there is some deviation from what I learned from scrum.org and that uh, 17 or 20 page uh, a scrum guide versus what I'm seeing in practice. So I'm kind of uh, trying to reconcile uh, yep. you know, uh, what my current reality as far as, as far as the work environment is concerned versus what uh, the learnings I've had from Scrum.org. Yeah, Bavesh, I did, I, 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 I did finally remember the name of that book. It's Tribal Unity, and I pasted that into yeah. the chat for you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks again for everybody who uh, shared their views. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, this is this is principally like one of the benefits of a product management association is a lot of times we think we have a unique problem or like our, our organizations, our engineers are telling us, well, you're you're nuts, you're off in left field, and then you compare notes with other product managers and you find out no, <laughs> this is a problem that is not it's not just my problem in my situation, but this this is something that's endemic to you know an industry or a type of work. Uh, and being able to validate with other product managers, I think, has uh, tremendous benefits so that you can compare notes and come back with a little bit of confidence saying, well, here's the industry consensus across Silicon Valley. Uh, and, you know, if you want to argue with that, I can. <laughs> very, well, very, we get outnumbered by by a lot of other departments frequently. So I think that's useful. Yeah, the, the interesting thing for me being a consultant in uh, product management is, you know, I work with a telco company and then I start working with a financial service company. I'm going like, your problems are just like theirs or I'm in a training class and the person who is, you know, responsible for, you know, uh, outboard motorboat engines, you know, and the person who's doing a software product, all of a sudden they're looking at each other and they're going like, we have the same problem we're dealing with. <laughs> And so, yeah, uh, you know, a lot of product management problems are not unique. They, you know, are shared across uh, companies and industries. Yeah, that's very, <laughs> very interesting to have, be able to, to have that in your back pocket and, and uh, realize some of the best insights I've ever gotten have been from people in completely unrelated industries that maybe had a different, slightly different way of looking at a nearly identical problem. Mm -hmm. And they had a couple of extra hints or insights that they tossed into a conversation that wound up being pivotal to, to uh, hitting the next level um, in you know, a completely unrelated industry. So uh, anybody else have any questions? Uh, feel free to unmute or raise your hand. I'm watching the screen here and trying to see if I can get through here. David, good to see you. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Thanks. Great talk. Um, this got lost somewhere back in the thread. So, so here's um, what I wrote in the thread here was, how would you choose where to start and how to prioritize focus across 
all those symptoms of agilicity, if that's a word, if you were setting out to help an organization be agile or be more agile. So, you know, it's uneven. There's some of the symptoms to a greater or lesser degree. How do you pick where to, you know, which arrows to put the wood behind? I, I, I think that Tom and I would both would both use the uh, consultant's response of it depends. Sorry. No, uh, no, I didn't ask where. I just that's what I'm saying. So what's the process, right? You, you, it depends. Yeah. So what I would I would look at what can I push on, and and that's where it depends is is what what might I what might I have an effect on, what might my organization have an effect on, where 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 do I have uh, uh, opportunity to tweak the organization. And it might be, uh, and, and certainly um, uh, respect and trust and psychological safety, those are, those, are, those are huge behind every single high performance team that exists. Um, getting um, um, one, of the, one of the mantras that I see missing, um, one of the mantras that I see product managers thinking they're delivering but isn't getting through because it's not a mantra, it's, it's a one time or two time or even three or four or five time thing is what's, what is this for? What's the impact of this thing? What's the difference it's gonna make in the world? And, and that is, that is um, you know, I talked about one of, the, one of the ways we can improve productivity in teams. Uh, this is another one of those, which is motivation. And, and the, the, the thing that motivates software developers and testers more than just about anything else is the, is the opportunity to make an impact on the world. And, and knowing that that thing that I'm working on has connects into this larger thing, which connects into our mission to, to make that impact on the world. And here's where, here's where it's gonna make that difference. And I think I, you know, there, there's a huge one that, that it seems small, and, 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 but, it, but it goes back to sales, which you know, salespeople will all tell you it takes, you have, to, you have to say it seven times or nine times or 13 times, they've all got some number, but you've got to say it a lot in order for people to actually hear it. And, uh, and I think that's a huge one for this, for this audience, for product management. Well, I think I think what you uh, one of the words you didn't use there specifically, but we're referring to, and, and this is something that I've seen in organizations, and that we also talk a lot about in 280 Group is starting with the why. So some of you know uh, Simon Sinek's book about starting with the why, and you know we can talk about what transformation we want to make, but if we can't talk about why that transformation is important then it makes it that much harder, you know, for people to buy into. And, and I, there was one organization I was working with uh, in the past, again, you know, kind of that three or four year time frame ago, where they were trying to move, uh, they were already a product company, but they wanted to expand into a broader range of solutions for their particular industry. And the general manager was so frustrated that, you know, I, we've been talking about this for two years, but yet people are still thinking this way. And I realized as I was looking through some other things that nobody understood why this change was important. And that hadn't really been communicated. Uh, and they had the information there to communicate it. They just hadn't leveraged or used it. And, and they believed everyone knew. Yeah. I, I will yeah. leave odds that they believed That's everyone. right. Yeah. That's um, just because so the problem is not of, So sorry, Tom. I was going to say that's as big of a problem as as not knowing is assuming everybody else already knows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, going back to um, you know, you each of you may have uh, may be able to impact a team, or you may be able to impact a whole organization, or you may be able to impact executives. If you're at the team level, one of those places would be would be retrospectives. Do you have the opportunity to impact your retrospectives and make sure that coming out of your retrospectives is one thing that's going to make that's that's going to make our team more joyful? That's going to make us happier. One thing, or or uh, one thing that's going to make us more productive, or one thing that's going to that's going to increase the quality, or one change in the definition of done that's that's going to assure that, that every story actually is done 
uh, and, and we're not meeting that criteria right now. Or looking at our standups and saying, you know, our standups suck. It's just a bunch of status, uh, a bunch of status reports. We could do that in Slack. That's not the point of a standup. The point of a standup is, are we on track to meet our goal? That's why we're sharing that status is asking that question, are we on track to meet our goal? And if we're not, what do we have to do to adjust to get us on track? Or, or if, if, uh, if nobody, if everybody is underwater, then it's up to our product manager to say, here's the thing that we've got in our sprint plan that is the thing we should not do in the sprint because we're, we're clearly not gonna finish everything. We're gonna randomly not finish something unless I make the decision right now that this is the thing we're not gonna finish. That we're gonna move that back into the backlog and we're gonna finish all this stuff that's gonna make the most import on our executives, our stakeholders and our customers. Very good. Any additional uh, thoughts and questions from, from folks? Well, all and right. Then, and then in that retro thereafter, we're going to have a little conversation about why it was we didn't estimate so well and ended up having a story that we had a problem with and ended up having to push back to the backlog, the product backlog. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, and uh, why it was that we, why it was that we didn't leverage our velocity effectively to be predictable or how it was that that somebody left all that technical debt in that area of the code that we haven't been in for a whole long time and no one realized it because we didn't log it. And maybe we ought to log technical debt so that it's clear to everybody where our technical debt lies or, so there's a ton of- we got there. caught flat foot. Our retrospective, is gonna, our retrospective is gonna be really interesting if we do a retrospective well. Yeah, well, that almost brings up a little bit of the, um, uh, you know, the, the work it takes running a meeting to keep a, a retrospective when you've had something slip from turning that into a, uh, a court martial of, you know, who are we going to scapegoat and what are we going to blame? Um, we want to, we, we want to start with Norm Chris prime, prime directive. And yeah. if, if any of you have not uh, if any of you have not visited Norm Chris Prime Directive, it's Googleable. I'm typing it in. It's Googleable. And basically, what it says is if we knew two weeks ago what we know now, we never would have made the mistake. We now know it. Let's celebrate the fact that we know it and look at what we can do to not make that mistake again. So where, where root cause goes wrong too often is we stop when we get to an individual. Mm -hmm. It's very seldom the individual's problem. Very much so. More often it is process or, or code or... Or communication or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all of those things. So, we, so you know, five whys. Uh, we get to an individual, keep asking why. Exactly. Well, well, Ron, one of the things that you just prompted me in, and this goes back to that book, you know, when uh, Agile goes physical is, you know, what happens in a hardware type wor world is sometimes you're making decisions that you actually aren't going to get to in development for another year and a half or two years. But those decisions that you made early on have locked you in to a direction that you only discover a year and a half or two years later. And so part of, you know, her point is identify those decisions where you have a uh, low level of information and figure out how can we go and test those, you know, hypotheses earlier on to increase the amount of right information that we have versus trying to make those decisions, you know, with very little information and feel like we're stuck in them. How, how can I de-risk those sooner than later? And I think, you know, uh, you know, why that retrospective wasn't exactly about that, you know, it does highlight that point of we made decisions with a certain amount of information. Now, what do we know now to help us have made a better decision? And how can we make get that information sooner? Yeah, and, and that goes to uh, when we're built when when we in product management are building our backlogs and ordering our backlogs. That's not a that's not a product management only 
task. That's a product management collaborating with technical leadership to ask the question, what, what, where, where, you know, where have you got a bad gut feeling? <laughs> because that's, those are where the risks are. Mm -hmm. And, and what story do we need somewhere near the top of the backlog that we eliminate that risk? So uh, now we're we're coming up on the bottom of the hour. Uh, I'd like to to uh, give give Ron and Tom a little chance to uh, closing thoughts, uh, just to kind of leave us with or things to go uh, that we can we can uh, at our our morning meeting when we get back into the office, uh, things we can think about or, or remind ourselves to to look into. I would go forth and be agile. <laughs> Well said. <laughs> All right, excellent. Well, thank you both, uh, uh, Ron and 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 Tom. This has been. Uh, uh, I, I know, you know, if the rest of the audience is like me, I had probably a hundred different ideas going in my head as you were saying things, and this is always one of the great things about talking to to true experts in an area and um, seeing that exposed to a, you know a broad spectrum of of product folks like we have in in these meetings. So. Uh, I'd like to thank both of you for, for presenting this evening. Um, for those of you who missed part of the call, we're hoping to get this up on our YouTube channel within a couple of weeks, roughly, depending on schedules of, of editing. But uh, look forward to that. And don't forget, next month we have our talk from uh, uh, Bear Robotics. And that should be you know another interesting uh, thought process of, of uh, um, you know, product management and maybe an environment that's a bit different than, than you're used to operating in. So thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you next month. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Letting, thank you for letting us address this topic. Thanks, it was very useful. Thank you. Great teamwork.